Good afternoon. Hi, welcome back from lunch. Um, my name is Alan Douay. I'm the product manager for uh, Loggergator. How many folks here know what Loggergator is? All right, lots of people. Anybody want to do a source code review for Loggergator right now? Just come on up here. Do uh, only joking. Um, today in the presentation, what I'd like to do is go over Loggergator, just a little bit of a high level, explain what it is. Um, how it works at a very simplistic level, and then we'll look at each of the different components. Um, Loggergator within the Cloud Foundry uh, kind of broader spectrum uh, is one of the components where you have to make choices about how much loss versus how much performance, how much resources you want to throw at it. And so we'll go over some tuning uh, tips here, um, some experiences, maybe a little bit of an explanation. Uh, about each component, and then um, some common problems. And these are problems that we kind of see quite often uh, from an inbound uh, customer request perspective. Uh, open it up for Q&A at the end, although if there's any questions along the way, please feel free to interrupt me. I'm, I'm happy to, to field some uh, questions. And um, because everything's better as a CF app, this presentation is actually pushed. You can go um, look at it live there on, on uh, that URL. So to kick it off, how does uh, Loggergator work? Well, Easy. It works just like this. This is the boxes and lines diagram after uh, of our architecture document. Um, one of the core things that, that we're trying to do with Loggergator is that uh, when you, outside of the Cloud Foundry ecosystem, when you have an app that crashes on a machine, you normally just log into the machine and go look at logs. If you want to go see the standard out, st standard errors, uh, maybe you have to restart that machine to get to it. Maybe the machine's crashed. But what you see is what the application uh, state was. Uh, at that termination phase. With Loggergator, you don't really, or with CF, you don't have that, right? Because the, the machines themselves are ephemeral. We, we get rid of them. If the app crashes, we kill that container and bring up a new container. And so there's no place to go back to. You, you, there's no, no going back to that, that old machine state. And so what we do is we create a system by which we take the standard in and standard errors and we bring them out of the containers, make them available externally. Uh, this is a couple things. It, it makes it uh, available. You don't have to be on that machine in order to get this information. But secondly, it really it just preserves it so that that way the state of the container isn't the deciding factor about whether or not you get to, to see information about what your applications, what they were doing, what the environment was like at the time that, that something happened. Um, it is very, fairly complex in that we have multiple different things that we're sending through Loggergator and multiple different outputs. Uh, the key thing that we do, though, is the application logs. And so within the broader diagram here, you'll see that we're sending metrics about the container. We're also sending component metrics through. Uh, there's different outputs. There's a native syslog piece. There's nozzles. We'll talk a little bit about each one of those. But at the high level here, I wanted to kind of go back, back down to a more simplify view and just look at app logs and, and show you kind of how they work at a, at a high level. So whether you're running DA or Diego, you have the same, same thing here. Uh, on each individual cell, you have one uh, component called Metron. And this isn't as part of the containers. This is just in the, in the host cell. And what happens is uh, if you're using Diego, Diego will come in and has a, a, a piece called Executor, uh, great name. Um, and it will actually start reading off from the containers. Like it will read each line out of standard error, standard it out, and put it into an envelope, a drops on envelope, and send it to the Metron, uh, the Metron component on that, uh, on that cell. Metron then sends that packet out over to a collection of servers we call Dopplers, right? And so the idea here is that uh, you have, with Loggergator, you have two different things. One, sending information from these cells, and then another, people consuming from that middle tier, that Doppler layer, and they're bringing things out. That's an important concept to understand because what we're trying to do when we talk about tuning is right-sizing that flow of information through. Basically, egressing the, the data out of the system as fast as you're inputting it in or finding that right balance. You can obviously over-provision uh, on one side or the other, but that's where you really kind of run into problems and you get what we call log loss. Uh, the log loss piece here is probably a big topic for Loggergator. Uh, you know, we've, we obviously kind of uh, have to answer this question a fair amount, like why do, I, why do I lose my logs? And when we design Loggergator, the key concepts that kind of come into play here for us 
are that we don't want to, in that, in that very first picture you can kind of see, we don't want to put any pressure back on to the applications, right? So uh, the, the, you know, the one thing that um, often happens is when an, an application is crashing, it's because it's got resource constraints, it's got uh, environment constraints, the, basically the app is under stress. And the last thing you want to do is say, no, you have to write this thing out to this service endpoint. Uh, and that's really where we would get into if we said, well, it's critical that all messages come through. So I don't want any of this stuff to what we call produce back pressure, produce uh, this requirement back onto the application in order to service this need. What that means is we allow a lot of preemption, right? We, we allow the uh, application to be able to send this out in, a, in that 12-factor uh, app way to just say, just log it to standard out, and I don't care. That's a transaction that I, I don't have to manage. I don't have to keep track of. I can just keep, keep moving on. Uh, what, what, uh, what will happen though is in some cases you end up seeing post that write, uh, things go awry, right? Like the application, uh, that particular log can be lost in, in several different areas. We'll talk about those in a little bit. The other uh, kind of tenant that we're trying to um, adhere to as we're, we're producing uh, Loggator is that we want to get you the information as quickly as possible. Uh, so that means that if there's something in the system that's slowing down or jamming up other pieces of the system, we're just going to let that information go in order to uh, prioritize traffic that's sitting behind it. We don't want stuff to get backed up, so to speak, and therefore we're going to try and send information as quickly as possible, find those areas and where, where there might be some issue and, and just blow past them. And then the, the last piece here is within the system there's a, um, this concept that we're going to allow multiple consumers to feed from this same information. So. Uh, you might have a, a monitoring solution that's pulling metrics and information out. You might have a, an integration with something, something like Splunk pulling logs out, but you still want to see those logs if you use CFTail, for example. And so within the, our system here, we, we syndicate effectively the information so that it's available, the same information is available to multiple consumers. There's several, several tricks along the way here to, to, to do different things, but kind of these are the tenets that drive the architecture of what we're trying to do. So when you, when you look at those pieces and you're talking about um, what we call loss or, or how to scale, right, tune the system so that you minimize loss, but you don't super over provision one way or the other, uh, really there's two, two things that are very kind of helpful for, for you to know as an operator or somebody trying to set up the system. One is what's your application log per some time period? Like how many logs do you think you're emitting from your apps every, for example, every second? Um, and then the second piece is like, how are you consuming these out? Are you running multiple nozzles or are you, uh, or is just developers just kind of casually come along doing tailing logs every now and then just to see what their apps are like? Do you have syslog drain configured? Uh, the reason for that is as you look at the components, each has an impact across the system we'll, we'll go through. So when you're, when you're looking at this, there's really the three areas that you have an option to kind of do things about when it comes to Loggergator. The Metron agents themselves, they're, they're the things that, that forward that load off of the, um, uh, the, the Diego cells into Doppler. The Dopplers, how many Dopplers you have. And then lastly, the traffic controllers. Now, within the system here, kind of the key piece as a, as a high level <clears throat> is to look at the Dopplers. The, these are the middle, uh, really, they're right in the middle of Loggergator, so to speak. Uh, and they're doing two different tasks. They're receiving information inbound from your Diego cells, and they're moving things out. When we see loss, I see, them, I see loss happen usually at two different places. Um, it can happen more, more than one place, but, but kind of the first place I really see loss happening is uh, when messages kind of get um, uh, stacked up at the Doppler itself. So your ingestion is faster than what your egress or your consumption of logs coming out of a uh, log aggregator is. And that, that happens sometimes when you have, uh, how many people here run something like Splunk or have a syslog out drain, right? Uh, lots of folks. Uh, when you have that kind of syslog drain and you're pulling that information out, uh, if, you, if you're pulling it slow, then what will happen here is that you'll, you'll start to see a message in Splunk. That's why I have about Splunk. You'll see a, a very helpful log message in Splunk that says, hey, by the way, we dropped like, 999 messages for you, right? And you're like, why did you send me this one then? And, but the idea here is what we did was we went ahead and made a conscious decision to say, hey, look, too many of these things are being stacked up in the middle. We're getting rid of the buffer so that we can actually let, st let more stuff flow through. It's kind of a signal that says one of two things happen. You either got a spike in traffic, 
beyond what your buffer could, could handle, or you just really slow ingestion based on what we have here. So you need to make a configuration change. It's basically telling you, go look at uh, how you can tune up uh, your log creator system. I'm going to dive into Metron first, and then we'll go to Dopplers and Traffic Controller. Uh, with, with Metron, we've done a lot of research, um, especially on uh, virtual machines, where we try to see how many messages we can pump into Metron before you start to see loss happen right there um, from the Diego cell to Metron. And, and really, we start to max out on, on uh, virtual hardware at about 8,000 messages per second. Um, for the purposes of kind of like a planning uh, area here, what I try to do is I try to, to help uh, folks target about 1,000 app logs per second is maybe the range where you want to look at, at um, how many Diego cells you need. So really, you only have kind of two options here, right? One is you can uh, increase your number of Diego cells. That means that the number of tenant apps on any one cell will decrease. And as it decreases, the load on Metron kind of balances out, it will subsequently decrease. Oftentimes, that's, that's usually the case. Um, the second piece here is, uh, when I mentioned earlier, is every single line within standard error, standard out, gets its own message. One way to decrease message traffic is actually to kind of trick uh, D, uh, the Diego cell into sending multi-line messages as one message package. Um, I'll, that's the next slide I'll show you kind of uh, what we're talking about there. Uh, but the key there is if you're in a, about a thousand app logs per second range uh, with, within each of your Diego cells, you have some additional overhead. You can, you can have spikes that, that will uh, you'll help accommodate you for. It also, there is a, a built-in, you're going to pay the price for some metrics flowing across. So every, every uh, um, container uh, per cell emits its uh, container metrics uh, every 30 seconds. So that's also flowing through Metron. So this kind of that thousand apps, a, a thousand logs a second, really kind of that thousand log messages a second, really kind of is that, um, is just a good baseline. You're, you're probably going to be sending about 2,000 uh, messages a second at that rate anyway. And again, it's just a starting point. What we really ask you to look at here is Metrons, uh, don't, don't overflow them beyond that 8,000 point. You're going to start seeing uh, loss happening there beyond the two two and a half percent range. And, and part of that is because Metron can't handle that, that rate on a lot of uh, hardware. You'll start to run into things like uh, UDP buffer size um, gets overflowed. So UDP will start dropping it. Uh, the Metron agent will start, its diodes will start dropping it through the process there. Uh, one of the key things here, I think we'll, we'll just actually jump into it. Um, how many folks have uh, multi-line like stack trace dumps, right? And then have you done anything about it yet? Or is any, no? So what you see with those stack trace dumps is that each line comes across as a separate message. And then even if you're using Splunk or Elk or, or any other you know, tool to try and reassemble logs, what you see is logs that kind of come across really choppy, right? In fact, they're hard to reassemble because you don't even know the sequence where they got in. Um, one of the key tenets about the system is that the Metrons send to Dopplers that are within its own zone. So when you when you're talking about uh, when you're talking about the number of Dopplers, you want to make sure that there's an equitable number of Dopplers for every zone. That you have, so you have three of them, three zones, for example, availability zones. Uh, instead of running 13 or 14, run 15 Dopplers. You have five each in each each area. Um, what that does is it gives you a better chance of having at least all of the messages within the same availability zone of Dopplers, but the Metrons will naturally try to spread the load out across those Dopplers. What that means is that you might not even receive those log lines in sequence from that because some of the lines might go to one Doppler, others might go to another Doppler. Uh, really kind of the, the strategy we've seen a lot of folks employ here, and, and apologies, we've been working pretty hard on log side to try and take care of this uh, multi-line issue, but it really boils down to like, this is a component portion of Diego, so we're working with that team to try and overcome this. You can kind of trick it. This is what we've seen a lot of folks do. They use something like log back and, uh, or, or the, every standard out before they standard out, they'll, uh, they'll add some sort of ruin to try and make it look like a single line. Uh, the key things to know if you do this, if you use a strategy to, to try and send a, a multi-line message and then uh, recompose it back at the consumer end, is that in certain versions of CF, um, we're going to truncate that for you anyway. We're going to go ahead and split that up 
uh, because we only want messages of a certain message size. Since we use UDP, uh, UDP has a 64K message sin limit um, before it starts breaking up packets anyway. And so in, in CF-237, I think, um, uh, we went ahead and increased the max uh, packet size uh, that, that the ex executor will create and allow to send through. So the multi-line messages you're going to start seeing in older versions will get truncated, but you'll see bigger and bigger messages that you'll be able to send through Metron. This obviously, what, one of the things this strategy does is it reduces your message rate through to Metron. And Metron doesn't care that the package is size X. It just cares that how many it has to send. That's its overhead, actually. And so uh, for a lot of folks, this is actually the strategy they would rather. They would rather send the message whole uh, as much as possible. We've been working on this for a while. Obviously, part of the Limitation, I think, from a technology perspective, has been um, the fact that we don't actually own some of the that that message assembly piece, the Diego team. But uh, we have been working on the aggregator side to try and make m bigger and bigger packages supported. There'll be some limit, obviously. We don't want you sending 10 gig log files through the system. That that'll obviously be a problem. But um, this is a good strategy for folks who are trying to who who have this kind of problem and trying to reduce their their message rate through the Metron. And then there was Dopplers. Um, Dopplers are interesting. The, the key piece here, I think a lot of folks will kind of like rule of thumb, uh, say that about four to one, four Diego cells per Doppler is kind of where you want your, your, um, your deployment sizing. That's okay. I mean, one of the things that, that I kind of start off with is say, if you know what your average rate is through a system, then the Dopplers, you don't want them to get them too high, too much above about 4,000 messages a second. And that's messages total, so that's the metrics coming across as well as the logs. And the reason for that is that uh, obviously, actually, and technically, the Dopplers can take more ingress than that. But what we start to find is that on the consuming side, you're gonna you're gonna actually not be able to pull it out as fast as that. And so, the the Dopplers have an interesting feature. They each each of the Dopplers have every single sync. So if you guys do a syslog uh, configuration, that's cups-l, where you send it directly to your syslog stuff, the log there, uh, it'll create a, what we call a sync for that, S-I-N-K, not, not synchronization, S-I-N-K. And the, the idea there is that that's what we call a, a buffer, a queue, if you will. It allows us to put messages in there and hold it temporarily. It's completely a temporary store while consumers start to pull information off. The idea there being kind of twofold. One, we allow you to kind of use that for spiky traffic. So if you have, a, if you have the same kind of egress from the system, you're pulling information out of Dopplers as fast as you're putting it in, and then you get a big spike, uh, it's a, just a place where it'll let you kind of pile them up for a bit so that your consumer can continuously take them out. The second piece is we store it temporarily so that you can kind of see that backlog. Anybody ever run CF? tail safe logs and then tail some logs out and you see like the, the logs that that previously had we'll store like a hundred of them for you so we can kind of see that Th those are the concepts there now every single sync gets their buffer on every single doppler meaning the dopplers have uh, if you have five or six different uh, consumers there you might have a bunch of these different uh, sync in there and their subsequent buffers so when you look at that you need to consider hey am i uh do i need to put additional ram or or um uh, ephemeral disk here for, for my Dopplers, just to give them sort of some room if you've got really, really large buffers. Um, one of the big things that, that changed <clears throat> a lot of CF releases, we changed like the default buffer size. The buffer size is per message count, not per size. Uh, and previously it was 99 messages. So if you've ever seen that you lost 98 messages, you know that you've got 99 messages as your, your buffer count there. Uh, but recently that's been up to, I think, nine. 1,999 just because uh, we feel like that's actually helping folks in terms of giving a little bit more headspace and, and it obviously, for the most part, you don't have a ton of, the, the messages themselves aren't very large so they're not taking up a, a lot of space on the disk. If you do send multi-line uh, messages, so you send those logs whole, then obviously you have to reconsider, you know, can you take uh, 10,000 messages at 60k a piece on there and, and make sure you appropriately size the Doppler so they can in kind of absorb uh, those types of pieces. But I want to kind of stress here that the that whole queuing that buffer piece is really not meant to be uh, as sort of a long term storage piece It's really meant to accommodate spikes if your consumer end is slow, then it, it won't ever matter you're always going to end up we're always going to end up filling the buffer and for us when we fill the buffer, we just drop the whole buffer we just kill it all, 
and then let the stuff behind it come through. And that's, that's sort of the methodology that, that we're using right now. What it means is you do get that log message that lets you know that that happened, but no guarantees of what, what we just dropped. Whatever was there, that's what, we, that's what was dropped. And that's per that buffer per sync. So in order to avoid that, what we, we kind of hope to, to get people to do is, is look at three things. First, you know, look at the number of Dopplers you have per zone. You know, like in, in a couple of cases that I've looked at, uh, folks had uh, you know, four Dopplers in two zones and, and three Dopplers in one zone. And so it just so happened that they, as they were seeing that log loss, it was from the dop it was in the zone where they had three Dopplers. That that's where you'd end up seeing the consumption for whatever reason. The ingest effectively there was happening faster across those three Dopplers than they were in the in the other Dopplers in the other zones. So try and balance them out. Make sure you don't have an imbalance there. Secondly, uh, look at your buffer size from a, a you know sensibility perspective. If it's if it's at a hundred, you could probably do more than that, but. But uh, is it really accommodating um, spikes or do you have sort of just slow ingestion throughput? If you have slow ingestion throughput, you have two options there. Um, one is you can actually kind of decrease Doppler's ingestion rate by increasing the number of Dopplers. And so it'll spread the load, the Metron will spread the load. Then the average rate of ingest into each one of the Dopplers will effectively go down. And so if you're pulling it out, that doesn't necessarily mean that that's gonna work for you because obviously it still has to go pull all the information from all the areas. Uh, each of the Dopplers, but it will it will basically mean that each one of those buffers have more time before they're going to expire, right? Before they reach their max load. Um, the second thing you can do is, uh, if you have this opportunity or this option, you can create two two nozzles and use the same subscription ID. That effectively splits the traffic up. So uh, what what will happen on that front is uh, each they, they'll basically pull from the same sinks, but they'll randomly pull half the traffic each, right? And so that effectively it doubles your, your egress of the information out of the system, but of course it means you'll have to figure out a way to reassemble that stream back on your consumer end. Um, but these are some successful strategies we've talked to other folks about and, and we've looked at. It's really that balance area. And unfortunately there's no one answer here. What you look at is just a combination of those different things. How do I get that right balance of flow through the system? and using the buffers just as that sort of that spike, uh, that spikiness type of um, uh, accommodation. And then lastly, the traffic controllers. Uh, I think some information has been out in the past about you know, how many traffic controllers per Dopplers. That's okay, that's kind of a good rule of thumb, but in general you wanna look at how many consumers you have when it comes to traffic controllers. Uh, within the system, if you're familiar with like a reverse proxy, that's effectively what traffic controller is, it's saying here's one endpoint, but it creates connections to every single sync on every single Doppler. Uh, and so as a result, what you can do is if you have a ton of traffic controllers, but only one or two nozzles, you're basically making the Dopplers pay an extra overhead cost for, for managing each one of those connections. When in reality, you don't, you don't need to do that. And in fact, you can probably help the Dopplers out there by scaling down your traffic controllers in that, in that respect. Uh, there are some things, obviously, you don't want to scale them down. You don't want to constrain them too much because they are proxying and managing that output uh, for you. But what you want to do here is maybe look at how many different consumers you have. If you're just running one nozzle and people are coming CF tail, usually a couple of a couple of traffic controllers are enough for you on that front. Um, so that's the that's kind of the high level pieces for for traffic controller. I'm going to stop here because the next pieces I do are, are just common problems. Are there any questions or any areas where I can clarify for anyone? Yes. Yeah, that's a good question. So the, we get this request a lot. So that, that is actually in, uh, in the backlog as a request, both the prioritization of uh, log messages from a, um, um, so we call it a classification scheme where we'll say priority one, priority two, priority three, and then try to somehow uh, sequence out and drop like priority threes first and then priority twos. The, the challenge I think on our end is that there's probably a, a bit of work we do before that around saying, can we even segment the stream? For example, right now uh, you're getting message loss, but you don't know whether those messages are in fact logs or if they are metrics coming from other parts of the system. In fact, they're probably a combination of both. So uh, we feel like one of the other requests here is maybe to split, across, split apart those particular pieces. So now when you have log loss, you have log loss, you know, or metric loss. And so maybe our first uh, attempt at this will, will likely be to try to split out 
logs and, and uh, metrics into different streams and then try to prioritize all logs first and, and instead of introducing a you have to pick how you want you know the classification of the logs to be. Um, so that's some future stuff that we're looking at, yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, sure. They're actually, it's uh, synonyms for us. The, the sync is really that visual representation, and I almost apologize to say this, of having like a, a, a sync with a faucet with a, you know, you turn on the hose and that's the, that's the metrons sending into the Dopplers and then the drain effectively. So in fact, I think we even call it syslog drain just because we want to like reinforce that visual uh, is pulling that stuff out. So it's just like a sink. If you're, if you're not able to drain as fast as you're putting in, you're going to overflow. And for us, the moment we overflow, we just dump the whole sink out and then give you a, a fresh one. And that's really what it's meant for. It's not meant for longer term storage. Anything that's in there is going to be pulled as soon as you have a consumer that's ready to pull it. Uh, and, and so I, I sometimes we call it cues, a buffer sink. Um, my apologies here. But it, I think in the documentation, we call it officially a sink, S-I-N-K. Uh, I'll just start here with a couple of like the most common uh, issues that we're seeing around the, that come to us from a um, you know a perspective of uh, support issues or support escalations. Uh, one of the challenges within the system is when you have this many components, they have to have a way to find one another. We don't actually hard code it. In fact, what, we, what happens is when we want you to roll or produce another set of Dopplers, we want all the other components to dynamically find those new things. So we don't want to throw everything away. We, we're trying to help. Um, in fact, we don't want you to roll these. Um, uh, in order to get more Dopplers, we don't want you to roll Diego cells, for example. And so what we do is we use etcd as our service discovery component. Um, and uh, most of the time, I'd say probably close to 50 or 60 percent of the issues that get escalated to us end up having to do with some challenge that happens, some breakage along this route here, where uh, Metron, for example, um, is talking to, I'll, I'll give you a specific example here. One time an etcd node came up and it didn't join the cluster, so it created its own cluster. And now Dopplers, some Dopplers say, hey, I'm new, and it talks to, it goes to console DNS and it says, hey, there's an etcd IP address, and it goes there and it says, I'm registering, and it finds itself the only one there. And now Metron agents, even though it's in a, it's one of ten Dopplers in the system, two or three Metron agents start to say, "Hey, I'm also redirecting now," and then they start to flood that one Doppler. So there's a classic output on this: is you say, "Well, some of my apps I'm getting everything, but I'm just missing tons of logs on these other apps." And we we end up always saying, "Go check your etcd health cluster," and they always come back and say, "Well, etcd is fine." And you say, "How many of them do you have?" And then they say, "Well, two. And that's the problem right there, right?" Um, so one of the things to check out is these other systems. And, and that's uh, the etcd one has, I think, a couple of manifestations. There's that one. Sometimes the keys get missed. Sometimes an event in etcd, so a change like, hey, a new traffic controller has come online or a new Doppler has come online, doesn't get publicized or pushed as other pieces. Oftentimes what you'll hear from a support perspective is somebody say, well, just go roll that Doppler or just go roll that traffic controller. And then it suddenly works. Nine times out of 10 when that happens, this is what's behind the scenes causing that. It's, it's that dynamic configuration isn't quite synced right. And so they don't know of one another and that's what's kind of causing that, that flow piece. We're, we're obviously spending some time here. We're, we're like, like all the components from a service discovery perspective, we're trying to uh, make this a bit more robust and, and consolidate it down. Um, but this is probably the number one piece there. Uh, if, you're, if you're managing a logger deployment and you see issues here, start here because this will, this will probably save you some time. Um, the other one is we get a lot of questions because people do see this big long, this message that comes in and says, hey, we've just dropped 9,999. And it's almost always because they're a slow consumer. And most of the time when we look at this, it'll be, um, you know, you're using Splunk and you're using like a small syslog forwarder, uh, but you're sending a lot of information its way. Uh, and so there's a couple of different strategies on that. You know, you can... Uh, if, if you're using something like that, you go move up to a heavy or, or medium um, syslog port or something that can pull information faster. Uh, most folks don't know this, but you can actually spread the load. You can actually send this to like a load balancer, an F5 or something like that, and spread it across multiple uh, consumers behind us, behind the scenes for us, and that'll usually speed up the write. Technically, what's happening on the syslog uh, drain piece is that we have a routine that's writing out, and so it's waiting for the response back over that connection before it writes the next one. 
And so that's why we know when something's slow is we can say, hey, we just waited a really long time for, for these pieces and now the queue's backed up. And so uh, again, based on just that, that simple architecture, what we do is we just go ahead and drop the whole buffer and try to bring in uh, the, the latest, greatest, the newest uh, messages behind that in order to try to catch up. When you see this, m most of the time, if you, you see it, we, we're gonna ask you for, for two kind of pieces of information. Is this because of a spike? Do you think this was anomalous? Um, if so, consider either spreading out your load across multiple Dopplers or increasing your buffer size. Or if it's continuous, uh, we're gonna work with you on how to get egress faster out of the system. Even though you might spread it across multiple Dopplers, the best way to go is look from the back end. If you can get it out of the system faster, you won't, you won't get this issue, this message. It's a lot easier normally to, to try and do that. It's a lot better across the board. Yes? It's also relevant for HTTP-based syslog? Yes, it is. Yes, that's exactly right. Uh, we, we do writes across that for syslog drain, irrespective. If you're using something like the Firehose syslog nozzle, that's a little different. But yes, it's effectively the, the same kind of thing if you can get it faster out the better for you. Uh, if you ever need to get a hold of somebody or you want to uh, just chat with the Loggergator team, more than happy to do that. We're based out of Denver, Colorado. Um, we are always interested in kind of hearing feedback about Loggergator. Uh, we're kind of like deep in the guts of CF, so we don't always get to, um, to meet everybody, so it's just kind of fun. Uh, feel free to Slack us. That's usually the, the best way to get a hold of anybody. Um, we have some good documents, and, and uh, we try to document, at least in the GitHub repository, as much as we can. Uh, it's probably one of the better ones if you ever want to look at some of the source code and, and, uh, and documentation there. Um, we do put up a decent amount of, of information, so feel free to, to kind of look through there, uh, reach out to the team. I'm happy I'm going to be here for the rest of the day and, and some of tomorrow, so if anybody wants to ch chat about Loggergator, let me know. happy to do so. And right on time. Cool. Thanks.